I've tried to create songs that help people learn Scripture. So today, you, you might already know the Psalm 23, but if you don't, perhaps uh, you'll get a little closer to knowing it this morning. So Josiah on Sunday mornings is, is normally right where you see him uh, this morning. He's the drummer of our praise team. And uh, he was encouraged to see the box back there and wondered if he could be a part of things this morning. I said, why, of course. And so I uh, get to have the, the privilege of getting to know him and some of his skills this morning. So, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, I shall not want. In green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, I shall not want. In green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. So is my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows. You've anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows beginning surely goodness and loving kindness follow me all the days of my life surely goodness and loving kindness follow me all the days of my life dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, having shared those things, I uh, will get my microphone put where it should be. There we go. And... <laughs> Thanks, Josiah. Uh, it was a lot of fun to be here with you and, and playing drums with you and stuff. That's fun. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to the ministry that we're a part of, which is Village Missions. And uh, one of the things I really like about Village Missions is that they're really good at making videos. And so uh, I, I wanted an opportunity to to just present you with the idea because I think it can accomplish a lot in a short period of time. And so if, if uh, that's possible, I'd love to show that. I like the Bible folded, but I like it better when, in the shape of a man, it goes out into the world. A Bible Illustrated, Thomas DeWitt Tomich. Perhaps these were the words that inspired Walter Duff to start a missionary movement centered around one simple calling, preach the word and love the people. But with the prompting of his dying father, Walter Duff Sr., Reverend Duff committed the rest of his life to recruiting and sending 100 missionary pastors to rural churches that had no leadership. And it was the commitment to that vision where Village Missions was born. Village Missions was born for one reason and one reason only, 
to bring the Word of God to people in rural America. Small towns and communities that either had no church or watched as the doors to the only church were on the brink of closing. So one by one, Reverend Duff began training and sending missionary pastors to revive those churches. Word spread, and as demand for rural pastors grew, partnerships with ministries like Stonecroft allowed Village Missions to send more missionaries out to meet the need. By the end of his life, Reverend Walter Duff not only reached his goal of sending 100 missionaries, he sent more than 600 to bring the Word of God to people in rural North America. Or as Talman puts it, go into the world as a Bible illustrated. His focus was not on just providing a pastor for that local church, but to reach that spot on the road. People wouldn't come to a big city to hear the gospel, but they go to that little church in their community. Today, Village Missions has more than 185 missionaries preaching the word and loving the people across North America. But rural communities are changing and the needs are growing rapidly. The need for someone to not only share the word of God, but being a living example of it is greater than it's ever been. It used to be that a community with 500 people might struggle to have a church. Now it's possible to have up to 2,000 people with no church. The purpose of Village Missions is to make sure that there's a God-glorifying church in every place, and we focus on rural communities, in part because other ministries are not going there. We do that by making sure that there's a full-time missionary pastor to lead that church to be spiritually thriving, healthy, vibrant, effective in sharing the gospel where God has planted them, and intentionally seeing their community as their mission field, their first mission field so that their friends, their neighbors, other members in their community see that Jesus loves them and have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Reverend Duff's vision for the Word of God to reach rural communities is the same today as it was back in 1948. But the mission field has expanded, and while the message never changes, the methods to reach those communities must adapt. When we look back on the last 75 years of ministry, God's faithfulness is evident at every step. Whether it's a prayer partner, a donation, or a family who said, we'll be the ones to go. It's through the faithful support of people like you, He works. So, we celebrate that. We celebrate the lives that have been transformed by the gospel, the missionaries and families who have faithfully served their communities, and the financial partners who made it possible. We also look forward. We dream and pray about how Village Missions will be serving 75 years from now. Village Missions and that pastor and that church being authentic in relationship are more needed now than ever. We should be a missionary wherever we're at. And it's been part of our foundation and it continues to permeate where we're going in the future. We see more missionaries being developed to preach God's Word and love people. More churches moving from struggling to thriving. More people being transformed by the love of Jesus. More creative ways that churches are ministering to the needs in their community. More people seeing the Bible illustrated through village missionaries and the churches they serve. Village Missions puts people in out-of-the-way places, forgotten places, places often where, why would you want to go there? I, I hope that in the next 75 years, that Village Missions reaches into more smaller, forgotten places. In order to reach rural North America, long-term is what it's going to take. And it's through your support that all of it is made possible. How is God calling you to partner with Village Missions? Whether to be called to be a full-time missionary. Or you want to join through prayer and financial support for ministry in these communities. You can learn more or take your next step by going to our website at villagemissions.org. The video provides what I think is a pretty good overview of, of what, uh, what Village Missions is about. I would just say that 
that uh, my DNA for ministry in large parts were, were, were impacted through my time here. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but it's been over 20 years since I stood in a role that, that Mark and uh, his wife are in now. And so it's been a while, but uh, this place has impacted me in a great way. And I don't doubt that there's, there's, there's some of you who are watching that and thinking, wow, that's pretty cool. Sounds like something I could do. And it just might be the case that, uh, that, that it could be a spark that, that would lead you into a direction like that. If you'd like to talk about it more, I would love to, I'd love to, uh, to do that. We, we are in Azalea. Azalea is uh, mile marker 88 on I-5. And Azalea is a, a rural community. We have a post office, a fire department, and a general store and a gas station a little further up the road. And so it's, uh, it's rural, and uh, your gifts and support allow me to be creative. There's many people who are in, uh, full, in full-time ministry, and they're also uh, supporting themselves with other kinds of work. And uh, that's, that's a noble thing to do. I did that as well. Um, however, in your gifts and support allow me to be creative and do things like fishing derbies, and uh, visit people on a regular basis, and and I'm um, going we'll to share a little bit about how the the body of Christ serves uh, as as a just a, a it's a great asset. Missionaries uh, struggle to to provide what what a, a local church will naturally kind of organically do, and um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to be here with you, and. Um, I want to introduce my family to you. I think if we've been successful in providing, there it is. There's a picture of my family and and uh, the church where I serve. And um, Isaiah, my oldest, is 17. Pray for Isaiah. He recently had a car accident, our first first teenage car accident, and he's doing okay, apart from having the car that he drive uh, be in pieces. But uh, And then there's Anna, who's 15, Caleb's 13, Josiah, who's our drummer, is 11, and Callie Jo, who's 5. And um, Cindy, in, at the beginning of the school year, she's teaching a uh, kindergarten class, had to fill out paperwork for Callie Jo's kindergarten. And um, our, our education right now, our education system with our kids is a little bit different than it has been. It's sort of a combination of homeschool and charter school. And the charter school is using a homeschool curriculum, so it's sort of a quasi-charter school, homeschool situation. But Cindy was forced to choose some I can statements for, for kindergarten. Some of you are teachers, and you're thinking, I know about those. I know what I can statements are. Well, I was just casually looking at them, and I was pretty impressed. Um, some of them, listen to this one, see what you think. I can construct an argument supported by evidence for how plants and animals, including humans, can change the environment to meet their needs. It's kindergarten. And uh, I, I guess what they mean is a bird's nest or beaver. I don't know. That's sort of taken back by that. How about this one? I can communicate solutions that will reduce the impact of humans on the land, water, air, and other living things in the local environment. This is kindergarten. Um, Maybe recycling? Maybe? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it. Complicated goal for kindergarten. I think of Think of what we've already talked. You know, if you if you weren't at Sunday school, you missed something important. We were talking about the role of the church and and what uh, how CBC sees that and how just how it grows from Scripture. Goals can be tricky things, but they're really important. They're really important because without them, we can get get into into things that we never should be in. The local church, I think, has always found it difficult to major on what's important and and to stay there just to stay with what's important. I would invite you to find in your Bibles 1 Timothy chapter 1, as I do the same thing. We're going to be talking this morning about goals for ministry. And when I get it before me, we'll read it together. I'm reading from the New American Standard. And it begins in this way. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, 
and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange, doc strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to, to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. I was thinking about this idea of goals, which the text says that, that our goal, the goal of our instruction is love. I think it's important because we can easily get distracted away from the truth. And I think there's three reasons why this is the case. One is simply that we're sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We're willing to trade the truth for a lie in some ridiculous ways. Romans chapter 1 and verse 25 talks about that. And uh, if you've read the Old Testament, you've come across the people shortly after receiving the Ten Commandments, constructing a golden calf and falling down before it. And then later on in the story of Numbers, which is the book that, that we're moving through in, in, in Azalea, you'll see them trading the truth of God for some exciting dates with Moabite ladies. People are all too happy at times to trade the truth for a lie. False teaching is not something that's happening due to ignorance, but rather it, it seems to originate from the will. It's something that we want for some reason or another. And so it, we're, we're easily distracted simply because we're sinners, but also because we get, and maybe connected to this, is that we get bored relatively easy. Like so many sins, false doctrine can arise from, from something, uh, something that's good in, in its right setting. You think of how we love progress, and, and human progress, new inventions often lead to advan important advances in lifestyle. I'm thinking if, if Apple was to announce that there's going to be a new Apple phone, some of you would be thinking, looking at your bank account and thinking, maybe, maybe I can do that, you know, maybe I can get a new Apple phone, but certainly some people who are willing to stand in line to get it, and and. That's the way we tend to think about progress. But what is desirable in human progress does not apply in the realm of theology. The faith has been once delivered to the saints, the book of Jude tells us. And, and with Jesus, and with Jesus, the, he is the real that has replaced the shadow of the old covenant. I think of, how, how many of you remember Buzz Lightyear? Remember Buzz Lightyear? Remember his slogan? I don't think we've really analyzed Buzz Lightyear and his perspective on the world too much. But think about the slogan, to infinity and beyond. What's beyond infinity? There's nothing beyond infinity. Infinity's infinity, right? But, but we get the same kind of thing in our thinking. We think that there's something beyond infinity. There's always something out there. It, it's, it can't just be as simple as Jesus. There has to be something beyond that, something more so to speak. And so we can, we can get distracted and, and head off into the weeds, so to speak. We're sinners, we're easily distracted, and it's not to be discounted that false teaching is well-funded. It's well-funded by the demonic universe. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that that is the case. In, 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 in 1 Timothy, it talks about the fact that, that it is part of the demonic program to, to, to do that. So there's a real reason why we get distracted. And some of the, the, the kinds of false teaching that we get into are, is described here in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, it talks about strange doctrines. And you think of how do you know what is strange? We have to know what is normal. You can't really know what's strange unless you have some understanding of what's normal. And, and um, I think that, that it's a chronic problem for, for pastors in every age and in every setting is that God's people are susceptible 
to good speakers who are promoting strange doctrines. And we don't know exactly what, the, the, what was strange about the teaching or what was off about it, but simply that it was. In our day, we deal with some interesting challenges, do we not, Doug, and the other pastors here in this room? He didn't have Google, right? In order to be a preacher, you had to have some occasion where you're sitting, standing where I am, and, and, and before an audience. But in our day, if you have an, a, a cell phone and a good internet connection, you can develop a following. You can grow a following through your charisma, your, 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 your gadgets, and so forth. And it affects what we're doing here today. In what way? People no longer are dependent upon the spiritual leaders of their local church. They can immediately ask Google, ask YouTube, and have a plethora of opinions on any given subject. And so, and so it's, it's, um, it's an interesting time in which we're living. People get answers in different ways than they used to. But as we think of what would be the strange teaching that that perhaps Paul has in mind here. Certainly, the New Testament gives a lot of examples of, of, of what that might be. But before I get there, just give your pastor a real shot at the answer to the question. Give him a shot. Give him, a, give him the opportunity to respond. I'm remembering someone who was struggling with legalism, and uh, they, I, you know, I wanted to try and answer their question as they struggled what I think of Paul has in mind here about the strange teaching this this how is uh, how is the Old Testament fitting into the new economy and the new covenant I think that's a big part of what the strange teaching was about but when I was approached or when I approached this person I said you know we really need to talk about this and she responded by saying well, I'm really I'm going to go ask my Jewish friend just thinking but I'm your pastor. I mean, you come here each week and you think I'm supposed to tell you something important, but here I have this moment where I want to share something important with you. And you say, I think, you know, I'm going to ask Google. What? <laughs> and, and, and false teaching, people are easily distracted. Um, but, but in this case, the role of the law of Moses in the life of the church, how Jewish should non-Jews be? <clears throat> and I think the answer is in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. It talks about the fact that it is a, the law is a shadow of the good things to come. We could, we could add other kinds of teaching that, 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 that might be examples of what's off. But I think uh, one is that people have come to think that, that because they are made in the image of God, this is an example of false teaching, that because man has been made in the image of God and God speaks things into existence. Therefore, Christians should be able to speak things into existence. It's wacky. It's kind of like infinity and beyond, kind of just doesn't make, it, it doesn't follow. But uh, all kinds of things have, have come out that are absolutely false. And then another category, what, what I see, comes from verse 4, that there is a kind of teaching that is frivolous, just to use some F words. We spend some time with F words. We have false. Now we have frivolous, right? So frivolous teaching talks about people paying attention to myths and endless genealogies. I don't know exactly what is meant, but a story that is serving as the reason for a religious belief. That's what I think of There's the idea behind it is that, you know, something, it's a story. It's not necessarily true. It doesn't even pretend to be true. But it's, it's serving as the basis for some religious belief or practice. And um, it's also mentioned this, uh, this infatuation with genealogies. The result is that the people are left speculating about, about God's program, and it's not advanced. And and I think at first glance, we think of when have we been affected by myths and genealogies, and it, it, it just seems a bit strange. Um, but but if, uh, if it, you know, you think of the way some people will read the Bible, if, in, in this quest to get something more, they're dissatisfied with the surface reading of Scripture and thinking that there has to be something beyond that, some special meaning 
um, some deeper meaning. And uh, if you've been following our ministry, and, and you have, I look around and see people who have known us uh, all our ministry life. We spent a significant number, five years in Utah. And one of the surprises that people have of Mormonism is that the actual strange doctrines of Mormonism does, does not flow from the Book of Mormon itself. It flows from the experiences of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. That's where the strange part, the, the particularly strange, you can read the Book of Mormon and you'll never get to, the, to, to some of the, the, the this odder parts of the Mormon faith. And I would say similarly, you talk about myths and stories. Sometimes, you know, all of us, if, if we're walking with the Lord, are going to have some powerful experiences in our Christian life. Hopefully that's the case. And it's one thing to have a, a powerful experience of hopefully with the Word of God or even in this room. But when we take an experience or, or a story and we construct it into the basis of our theology, that's a problem. That's a problem. How can I ever refute your amazing story? As I had to at different times in, in Utah, somebody telling me about their, their, their temple experience and somebody being healed. Well, so, so now, now the theology and some positive experience is all intertwined. And the question comes, where is the word of God and the disentangling of all of this? Is it another story? Is it my story beats your story? Kind of, kind of thing that goes on. There's certainly a lot of room within our worlds. We think maybe myths and genealogies, but, but if you think in terms of what is the basis of our theology, what, what, what are we going to build upon? And although we don't, we're not accustomed to thinking about myths and genealogies, we are accustomed to thinking about non-biblical uh, basis of, of, of constructing. And, and that's something to be beware of. We need to be aware of the goals because we're easily distracted. We need to be reminded of them. Secondly, second this morning, we need to be reminded of what those goals are. And one of the reasons why I was attracted to Village Missions is that uh, my own view of ministry was displayed clearly in their motto, to preach the word and to love the people. I think much of it is captured in this verse 5 of the text we have before us. It says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And at the heart of what I heard this morning, um, what I know to be true of this place and 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 many other churches, thankfully, is that we're to be teachers of God's Word. As we set ourselves up for ministry, the Word of God needs to be center place in, in, in all that we do. We believe that a clear presentation of God's Word is what people need. As powerful of a testimony as I might have, what people need is the Word of God. What they can come back to when I'm not around is the Word of God. And that's, what, and that's what we need to center on. Much of ministry, and this is a big part of what we talked about this morning, much of ministry happens outside of this room. It's not, it's, it's not in this official teaching time, but it's at the breakfast table across the hall. It's in, the, it's in this little space between the stairs and the front, the front and it's, it's in the parking lot. And it's in all those settings that real, you know, sometimes we think of like what's real, what's, what's profound about the church experience. And as I see it and, and the years that I've had, those are some of the most profound times. Sharing the word of God in those settings has some of the most lasting impact. You will walk out of here and you will not remember the points that I've shared with you. I know that because I, I quiz people sometimes where I preach normally. They don't remember those things. They'll remember the conversation they had in the parking lot. They'll remember those things. And when somebody shares something at a key moment in their life, in a counseling type, type setting, as I sit with elderly couples who are struggling to, to, to work through how are they going to care for each other? How's it all going to work out? Is there going to be enough money? And if I can't hold the spoon to feed you, then how are you going to get fed? Those kinds of issues, just real, real practical things that people struggle with. Those are, those are the kind of situations that people like me find themselves in and, and trying to counsel these people and share the Word of God, the promises of, of, 
of uh, God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. I find myself saying that verse to so many people as they go through situations completely beyond their control. Our goal in whatever setting we're in is to preach the word of God. And secondly, the, the goal of that is to create authentic followers of Christ. You know, some education has as its goal simply to be informed. History is taught that way. And Christianity is historical. And sometimes education is conceptual, right? Philosophies would be an example of that. Well, Christianity is certainly related to philosophy. And some teaching is practical. And Christianity involves doing things. And some of you really latch on to that. And um, however, you can learn facts concepts and actions without those things being united to anything that give them meaning or purpose. So what is the meaning or purpose that unites our teaching and our action? Jesus doesn't leave us floundering for the answer. He says it's love. The goal of our instruction is love is what it says here. And Jesus reinforces that by saying in John 13 verses 4 and 35, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And so our love is, is to be modeled after the love that was displayed in the person of Christ and through his actions. Here in 1 Timothy, it's described even further. It's originate, it originates from within. And the idea that there's an impure kind of love hardly needs to be mentioned, but because of where I'm standing, I'm going to risk a Howard Merrillism. Um, Howard talked about cookies. He talked about people, the, the difference between loving people in the same way that you would love cookies. If you love people the way that you love cookies, what happens to them? They're consumed. They cease to be cookies. They're gone. And similarly, there's a, there's a kind of love that's toxic. And there's a love that the Bible describes that I think is pictured in the person of Christ. What it, what it means for us to love a person should be highly contrasted with that with which we think of in loving cookies. The purity on the part of our love is not something that's superficial. It's not an insincere faith, but it's part of a sincere faith as, as we look at what's before us in, in, in 1 Timothy here. It's part of a sincere faith and... Uh, a clear conscience. I think, I think that what the word for me that captures that, all that together is the word authentic. And so we teach God's word. Our goal is that these people would grow and be authentic followers of Christ, meaning that they would love God, they would love one another. And if we're going to do that, we have to model it ourselves. One of the realities of uh, our modern technological age is that Teaching on any given subject has never been, you know, easier to access. And, and um, I, I think that a lot of times that's a, that's a real positive. I know that this church, is, as well as many others, during COVID, you entered into the melee for real of online technology and, and equipment was purchased and and things were tried, and, and I, was, I was listening about the, the parking lot service, and I was remembering our parking lot service, and, and, and all that we tried, and some of it successful, some of it an abysmal failure, but, but things that we tried to do, but we, I think we learned something through all of it, and that is that church is not essentially a message. Church, the message is this, us together, and the Word of God. You know, it's, it's all of this together. And we can't, we can't recreate church by simply uh, getting a good camera and some good microphones and, a, a, and in improving our, our online presence and get it done. We just can't accomplish it that way. And even when we do it well, I found that there's people who are shut in, people who are still, that's their main access to any kind of spiritual encouragement. You know what means the world to them? Me from the pulpit saying, hi, Jeannie, how you doing? That's, that's everything. That's everything to be noticed, to be a part of something. And, and um, I, I've realized that in a, in a significant way. 
As a pastor, I show up in people's lives in all different kinds of moments. And the reasons why I do it is because I would say sometimes because I really do love God and I really do love them. But the other times it's because I know that I really should love God and I really should love them. And so I have to admit, sometimes it's out of duty. But I will tell you that that is one of the most memorable things that I do. In contrast, the, the, the most impact that I think that I can have is by showing up. And you know, some of you are terrified of what I'm doing right now. But you're, you're great at walking up to people and putting your arm around them. You're great at that. You're better at it than me. And a lot of other people, you're like pro at that. And what I'm trying to tell you is that the greatest tool I have in ministry is the Word of God, but next to that would be just friendship, just loving people, loving them in some practical way, showing up in a key, in a key moment of crisis in their life. In our church, we've seen some unique experiences because of the, you know, this kind of idyllic-looking church that, that's by the side of the freeway, the white church, with a little steeple. In fact, it was part of the videos that I, I almost said, see, that's our church. That's the one. But, um, but uh, people come into our parking lot. Um, one of them was Carl. Carl is a, a man that if you drove by the front of his house, this is what you'd see. You'd see a bunch of rainbow flags. You'd see a bunch of, uh, I hate this particular political figure. Um, I, uh, I am, you know, and, and he does no shyness whatsoever about what side of the fence his political leanings are. And I would drive by this man's house and wonder, I wonder if this person would ever attend our church. He came in our parking lot. And it so happens, I'm walking out of my house, just so happens, right? I'm walking out towards the church from my house. I live right there. He comes up and says, you know, I don't know if I believe enough to be in part of your church or whatever. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if that's going to be a one-off and I just show up or whatever, but I want to know if I can, if I can come to your church. Yeah, 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 Carl. Yeah, you, you can come. You don't, you don't have to believe everything we do to come. Just come. And you know, it, it's, it was the people of God. Uh, this is a question, one of the questions that were part of this morning. What would it be like like I was, the question I was thinking is, what would it be like for a lost person to come into your midst? And what would you do? How would you react to somebody like that? Would you be willing to steer away from some of the conversations that might immediately just kind of send things up in flames for some bigger purpose? Well, I'm very proud to say that the folks of our church did that. And they loved on him, and he's now part. He's part. I can remember him walking in and looking at the potluck looking at it, to going in and sitting there. And he sits and he has a good time. He's not where, he's not where we're going to write the book and have this great story about how this person became, uh, became this great Christian. But what's cool about it is just the role of the local church. It wasn't just me. It was all of us together loving on this person and moving them along, a big part of the discipleship conversation, moving them along as a group. And, and some of it's intentional, some of it's in, providential, you know, in God's working in people's life. And so, so it is that we try to replicate that which we want to be authentic followers of Christ so that we can move people that direction. And, and, and it looks like as, as a group, as we meet, those are some of the ways that it happens. We're all called to preach the word and love the people. Finally, this morning, goals are important because without them, we won't rightly evaluate our progress. In, back in 1 Timothy, he says, For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand what they're saying, or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Question that comes to me, it's, you know, a lot of conversations are had. How do we know the difference between a fruitless discussion and a meaningful one? Sometimes that's a big question I have for myself. And there's plenty of fun conversations that have no other purpose than just for fun, right? And uh, may, may they continue to be the case. But, but I don't, we don't want to lose that category of fun conversations. 
But I think we've all been frustrated when we've walked out of a meeting that, that just centered around concepts rather than action. Some people are like that. They get frustrated with just like all we did was talk about concepts. And um, because it doesn't involve doing stuff. Love does stuff. Love does things. It's, it's, it's verb. You know, it has, it's It's verbal. But it's not a list of stuff, even if you make a list. That's the, that's the challenge, is that we, we don't want to just talk about concepts, but we have to realize that if we just create a list and just concentrate on the list, we're still off, because we can do things from the wrong spirit. And, and, and yet, we're told that that is what separates that which is fruitless from the fruitful. Something can be good, but not done in love. Paul talks about this in, in uh, we'll get to a verse in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. And, and that, so our goal of having, at the, that's, that is love, evaluates how we're actually doing. It separates the fruitful from the fruitless. It's, it, it points to the question, how is what I am doing and saying motivating people to love, if at all? And I think we watch, uh, we just watch and, and how they respond. Uh, we, we watch and, um, and, and, and pray that they respond in the right way. How do we determine whether someone grasps what, we're const- conf- what, what they are confidently asserting? It seems that the focus here is placed on uh, what they're trying to accomplish in the lives of people they are, they're talking to. And uh, as a preacher, sometimes I think that rhetoric can cover a multitude of sins. I can just come up with a, a cool way to say something, that that'll fix everything. But there's a group in Matthew chapter 7 that, 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 that adds, uh, you know, talks about if Jesus, did we not perform many miracles and do many signs in your name? And Jesus says, I, I never knew you. And so added to that list of rhetoric, you know, there's lots of things that we think we can do instead of love. But Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in verse 1 says, says that if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. It doesn't cover the multitude of sins that I sometimes think it does. I do not want to be that. I don't want to be that this morning or any other time. It's love that covers a multitude of sins. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. My love expressed creates a desire in the one listening as, as well as patience when I'm wrong. And um, I think it's that things reproduce after their kind. Love begets love. Love sometimes says hard things. It's not simply a pat on the back, but sometimes it's, it's coming along and pointing out something difficult. James chapter 5 and verse 20 talks about that. Sometimes people reveal that they don't grasp the Christian faith simply by the way that they talk about things. They haven't understood it. Just in the, in, in, to go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, they confidently assert things but they're, whole, they're off because they've missed the goal. And, and my plea for all of us is like, let's not miss the goal of love. The goal of our instruction is love. We want people to love God and to love one another. And in order to do that, we have to do that as examples. You ever get the feeling that you, you hardly grasp the significance of what you're doing or not doing? I was observing that of this past week, sometimes moments come and you fail to realize what's actually happening. Maybe somebody else sees it clearer than you do. And I think that quite often, it's our involvement with people that has us in just a situation. We don't realize the impact that we're having. And um, there's sometimes you'll come across a writer that that clarifies things for you. And for me, C.S. Lewis is a writer who does that. He says, there is a future that I do not think nearly enough about. 
Maybe we think about our own too much. And uh, he says, he says uh, it may be possible for each of us to think too much about his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily upon on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it. And the backs of the proud will be broken. It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or, or, one or another uh, to one of these destinations. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, they are mortal. And their life to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is the immortals whom we joke with work with, marry, snub, and exploit immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. That's the reality of the ministry that we have as we rub shoulders with one another. We're all moving towards a destination as was brought out. There's a kingdom that is coming. We celebrated it when we, we took communion. We're moving people. One, our, our interactions matter is the point that I'm, I'm trying to get across is that it matters because, because this is, there's a destiny that's awaiting. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity, this privilege to represent you in many different places, first in Honduras and then, and then in Utah and now in Azalea. Thank you so much. Continue to be strong. Be who you've been, only better. God bless uh, Covington Bible Church. I'd like to close us in a word of prayer. Lord, help us to to stay focused on the goal of, of teaching with teaching your word with excellence, with the goal of producing love and from a heart of love in people. I thank you for this group of believers. I pray that uh, you would strengthen them, encourage them in the work that, that they would see uh, their efforts as significant and, and that in by some way they can remember today as, as, as encouraging as, as, um, as uh, I just express gratitude, Lord, for all that they've meant to me, I pray that you'd keep them strong. Help us to walk with you. We pray in your name.